uh, turn off the camera, turn off the microphone, and then uh, Julio is starting the streaming. I'm starting the recording. Um, okay. Yes. So now I'm recording. Give me a second. I want to double check. Okay. Now we should be good. So now, um, so Piotr is the president. So um, you I can. I will start. Yep. Okay. So welcome everyone to this defense talk and the defense of of Manuel Laguna. Uh, so um, uh, Manuel is a PhD student at the University of Zaragoza, and he will be presenting today his work. We have also uh, a committee. Uh, who is a spokesperson, uh, Roman Vernet, who is an associate professor at the University of Grenoble Alp, and also a researcher at INRIA. And we have secretary, who is Anna uh, Serrano, mm -hmm. who is an assistant professor at the University of Zaragoza. And it's myself, and I'm Piotr Didek, who is a, uh, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Lugano in Switzerland. So today we'll have a talk from Manuel, which will last around 40 minutes. He did his supervision and under, uh, he did his research under supervision of, of Diego Gutierrez and Bell and Masia. And he will give the talk approximately of 40 minutes. And before we start, I would just to let you know that this session will be, this, this talk and this meeting will be recorded. We also ask all the participants who are not speaking or presenting anything uh, to mute themselves and to switch off the video. Um, after the presentation, we'll have uh, time for, for questions. And then we'll, then the person who is asking the question and, of course, the manual will be allowed, will have the camera on and the mic on, of course. Um, mm -hmm. With this, I think this is this is all. And at this point, Manuel, yours the stage is yours. And please uh, tell us about you know your your thesis, which are uh, titled "Learning Visual Appearance, Perception, Modeling, and Editing." I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So uh, thanks for the introduction, <laughs> and welcome everyone to the defense of my PhD thesis. There are some videos, so I hope that you can see them properly. So we, uh, humans, are visual creatures. Visual data plays a key role in the way that we understand and perceive the world around us. About 90% of our input information comes just from sight. In a glimpse, we can gather data about the environment around us, acquire information on the illumination, or understanding the visual appearance of objects or images. This term, visual appearance, can be described as the look of an object or image and on how we perceive it. If we look at this photograph just after a few seconds, we recognize its beauty. We can say that we are in a dark environment in some sort of mountain lake and an astonishing northern light has been captured. However, visual appearance does not only refer to how we understand the real world. It also has a major impact in digital content creation where we want to have virtual representations that are perceived as if they were from the real world. Visual appearance determines our understanding of an object or of an image. And as such, it is a general term that embraces others, like material appearance. Material appearance can be defined as the visual impression we have of a material. In this photograph, for instance, we see the wild berries. We perceive their colors, the reflections, we can observe the shiny and glossy appearance of the blackberries or even have a velvety feeling on the red berries. However, even though for us understanding what we observe seems like something fairly simple, it is a complex process that involves a physical interaction between light and matter and how we or our visual system perceives it. Nowadays, computer graphics is a mature field and we have learned how to computationally represent the phys this physical interaction in many different scenarios. This is achieved by using complex algorithms that model this interaction between light and matter and using complex physical parameters that represent the materials, illumination, or geometries. This has allowed us, for instance, to simulate the appearance of black holes for the cinema industry, 
it has allowed us to create super realistic animations that could be used for developing more compelling social interactions or to develop super realistic catalogs for the furniture industry. It also has had an impact in the fashion industry where a user could potentially design and choose the appearance of the materials that they would like to wear later. However, although we know how to model such physical interaction in many cases, no definite theory of perception exists to explain how we understand the different visual appearances. This creates a disconnection between the physical parameters that are involved in the interaction between light and matter and parameters that humans understand. In this thesis, we aim at establishing connection between those physical parameters that govern the interaction between light and matter and perceptual parameters that humans understand. We also aim at furthering our understanding of material appearance perception and on leveraging this understanding to improve existing algorithms or to develop more intuitive applications for visual content generation. Specifically, the thesis makes contributions in three areas. We propose new computational models for measuring appearance similarity. We investigate the effect of confounding factors in our perception of material appearance and develop more intuitive applications for appearance manipulation. The first part focuses on methods for measuring similarity. This is a daily task that we perform effortlessly. For instance, when we want to purchase fruits and we want to buy the one that is in actually optimum conditions to be eaten. Besides, this is a fundamental ongoing problem in fields like graphics or vision. We contribute to this end by exploring how to develop similarity measures for material appearance and by exploring also the non-photorealistic domain of icons. In the second part, we study how the influence of confounding factors affects our perception of material appearance. Identifying the physical causes of the features that our visual system creates to understand what we observe is widely considered one of the central challenges in graphics and vision. In this thesis, we take steps toward understanding the influence of confounding factors. First, by analyzing the joint influence of illumination and geometry, and then by investigating the impact of motion in our perception of material appearance. In the third part, we focus on creating intuitive applications to manipulate visual appearance. Nowadays, we have enough power, storage, and also tools to precisely acquire and simulate the appearance of the real world. However, this leads to additional limitations. We have seen that there is a disconnection between physical parameters and human understandable parameters, but also the data that is captured from the real world is heterogeneous. It usually varies between acquisition methods and is very high dimensional, which yields a more restrictive process for professionals. In this thesis, we present two methods. First one, it, we present a method that allows for full body human relighting intuitively. And the second one, it allows to intuitively edit material appearance just from single images. As you can observe, there are some areas that are actually gray colored. During the defense of this thesis, in those, I will not go into deep detail. However, I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have later. Most of the content that is going to be presented in this defense has been already published, in particular in four journal publications, two peer-reviewed conference publications, and as one patent application. Also, when possible, we try to make all the code and data sets publicly available. If you want, you could scan the QR codes and later go to my personal web page or GitHub, where you can find all those. Let's start now with the section about how to measure appearance similarity. In particular, how to measure material appearance similarity. This part of the thesis has been already presented in the journal Transactions on Graphics and also as a SIGGRAPH poster. Also, you can gather the code and dataset from the QR code. We have seen that material appearance is the visual impression we have of a material. As such, it is a core aspect on how we understand the world around us. After looking at this image, just for a few seconds, we can clearly identify a red fridge made of the, some sort of metal, a table that is made of wood, 
or a countertop that is made of a similar material. We, humans, have learned to recognize, compare and the appearance and even infer the key, the key physical properties of materials just by briefly looking at them. However, this is a complex task where many variables come into play. First, we have the scene containing several objects with different shapes. There, we can find the geometry that we are interested in. This geometry will be made out of some sort of material, usually represented as a complex mathematical function. Then we have the light. The light will travel, intersect, bounce, and interact with other objects. In the end, this yields a complex high dimensional function that depends on many variables and that it forms the final image of the kitchen that we have seen before. However, this is not all. We will observe this scene and we will create a visual impression of it. This visual impression will depend on the physical parameters of the scene that we are actually observing on how our brain integrates this information and also on our previous experience. All those add a new level of complexity to the problem. And although the problem is complex and it involves many variables, we humans have learned how to compare the appearance of materials effortlessly. If we observe these three crops, most of us will think that the chewing green are more similar. Comparing the appearance of materials is a fundamental concept that we rely on to perform daily tasks. However, human perception is far from being fully understood and the difficult problem of establishing a similarity measure for material appearance still remains open. Moreover, a measure of material appearance correlating with human perception is a challenging but interesting goal that could directly help us with several applications. Creating a measure that given two input images tell us how similar their materials are is an interesting goal with open challenges. First, we want our metric to be consistent with human behavior. To do so, we have to take into account the subjective nature of human perception. Also, we want to be robust to the interplay of confounding factors like geometry or illumination in the final perception of appearance. By confounding factors, we actually mean those physical variables that are capable of changing the final appearance of a material and our perception of it. In this case, we observe how a change in illumination yields completely different brass appearances. Now, coming back to our similarity measure, if we would develop a metric that would work only in image space without taking into account human judgments, we won't correlate with the human notion of a material appearance and will be biased toward pixel differences. On the other hand, a measure that works only on the material representation itself would be unable to take into account the effect of confounding factors. That's why, to correlate with human perception, we take into account the properties of the material, in this case represented as an image, together with human judgments about them. There has been previous attempts to create similarity metrics modeling human behavior. However, they have been working on other artistic domains and did not explicitly model material appearance. Other line of research instead has focused on deriving appearance metrics that are based on the material representation itself or by using image-based approaches. However, this work differs from us as they do not explicitly take into account human perception. Now, to create our similarity measure, we will start by making a database containing several stimuli. Then, we will use it to launch several cross-sourced user studies on material appearance and leverage the last two to learn our similarity measure. Last, we will show several applications that benefit from such measure. Let's start with the dataset. We create a new dataset of render images using six different illuminations that combine high and low frequency content. We also use 15 different scenes that vary from smooth to complex surfaces and use 100 materials from the MERL database, a database containing 100 materials measured from the real world. We obtain a total of 9,000 unique samples that we later use to collect data on material perception and to train our similarity measure. Now, let's see how we collect data on material perception. We gather data in the form of relative comparisons, where they usually shown only one image without semantic information. And we ask them which of these two candidates has a more similar appearance to the reference. 
In the end, more than 600 participants took part in the experiments and we collected more than 110,000 comparisons. Now, let's see how we create our similarity measure. Our main goal is to find a measure of material similarity. We can define it as the distance between two input images. This distance can be seen as the square Euclidean distance between the function f of both images. But what is actually f? We can consider f as the feature vector of each of the images. And in order to obtain it, we forward them through a deep neural network. Our model then, given an input image, will transform it into a feature vector that is well aligned with human perception, meaning that images that are similar, according to us, will be closer in the feature space. We train this model using a loss function composed of two terms. The first term is responsible for optimizing distances in the feature space. Before training, the feature space of our model does not reflect human judgments. And it says that the rabbit is closer to the angel when, uh, when users have answered the opposite. Our metric pushes together materials that are similar according to user answers and pushes away the similar ones. After training, the samples that are similar for humans will be together in the feature space, while the similar ones will be far away. The second loss term is actually responsible to confidently predict human judgments. To do so, what we do is to move from the original distance between two materials to the probability of choosing the most similar one, according to human answers. First, we transform our distances to similarities, where a value of one means perfect similarity. Using those similarity values, we get the probability of the model to choose the image that is similar, according to human answers. Last, we will optimize this loss term in order that the model uh, predicts the image that has been chosen as the similar one by the users with a probability of one, while it predicts the one that has been chosen to be dissimilar with a probability of zero. After training our model with this combined metric, we obtain a feature space that correlates with human perception, and that can be also visualized in a two-dimensional representation. Here we can see how materials are clustered in coherent groups. Now that we have our model capable of producing meaning, a meaningful feature space, let's see how to use it. Assigning materials individually to each geometry in a scene is actually a complex process. We can leverage the fact that the distances in our uh, feature space correlate with human perception to provide controllable material suggestions. For instance, we can progressively move further away from the original aluminum in a controlled manner in order to automatically populate the scene with a different variety of materials. Also, the suggestions do not need to be automatically assigned to the scene. They can be also used as a palette for the artist to choose from. This would facilitate browsing and navigation through big databases. In this case, we have here the violet square that shows the reference item and five other samples with a short distance to the reference according to our metric. If we progressively increase this distance, we can see how we obtain sets of materials whose appearance is more dissimilar. On the right, we also have another example, in this case, with a more diffuse look. We can also observe how as we increase the distance, material becomes more different to the reference. Also, other interesting application of our metric is that it can be used to extract information in an unsupervised fashion. This is the case of big unlabeled material datasets. For instance, we could use our feature space to obtain clusters of perceptually similar materials. Then, perceptually meaningful clustering leads in turn of the possibility of database summarization. If we take the closest sample to the centroid of each cluster, we can obtain a high-level summary of the content of the database without actually looking into it. We can leverage our database summarization technique to automatically populate the scene. In this case, if we select materials that belong to the cluster that look similar to plastic, we create a scene with a set of toy robots, or by selecting the materials from the cluster of metals, we can create an army of deadly robots. Now, let me summarize the contribution of this first part. 
We have presented a deep learning based similarity measure for material appearance that correlates with human perception. We first created a synthetic data set with a variety of appearances. Using that data set, we have collected data on our perception of material appearance. We leveraged the previous two to build a similarity measure for material appearance correlating with human perception. Last, we saw several applications that could benefit from our measure. However, human perception is complex and still far from being fully understood. Now, this is the slide that we have seen to motivate the effect of confounding factors. We can see th uh, here the images, sorry, we can see here three images with the two different materials and two different illuminations. Our model outputs a smaller distance between the first two, that between the first and the third, which are the one with similar material. This shows that we do not attempt to classify materials. Also, this shows how a change in illumination can yield complete different appearances. Many factors come into play that influence the final appearance of a material. Fully identifying them and in their understanding their interactions remained as an open fundamental problem. OK, now we will move on to the last part of this section. In this case, we aim at measuring visual appearance similarity for a non-photorealistic domain. In this case, icons. This work has been already published in the Multimedia Tools and Applications Journal. When we design an interface, we usually rely on icon datasets. There, thousands of items with different styles and visual identities are available. In this case, selecting icons that serve similar visual features is a cumbersome task where we have to be manually finding and selecting each element that we later want in our interface. To ease this task, in this part of the thesis, we present a deep learning based similarity measure for icons. Our measure can be further used to look through large unlabeled datasets, as it can be seen in the screen, where the icon on the left represents the reference and the ones in the right represents the more similar one, according to our models. As a summary, we collected a data set of icons from online sources where each icon is paired with semantic information given by the artist. Then we propose a Siamese architecture to learn our similarity measure. Uh, sorry, we propose a Siamese architecture. To learn our similarity measure, we rely on the semantic information of each icon, and we do not explicitly incorporate human ratings, as opposed to the previous work that we presented on material similarity. Last, we demonstrated how our measure can be useful for retrieving icons for large data sets. Now we move on to the second section of the thesis. Here, instead of focusing on developing a similarity measure, we focus on understanding the effect of confounding factors in the final appearance of materials and in our perception of them. First, we will start by analyzing the joint influence of geometry and illumination on material perception. This work has been already published in the Journal of Vision. As we have already seen, confounding factors play a key role in the final appearance of materials. If we look at these spheres, we can just see that changing the illumination can completely change the pixel level appearances. However, there is still something there that is telling our visual system, maybe they are just two chrome spheres. Something interesting happens when we change geometry. We can observe how the object of the left has actually a much more diffuse appearance than the complex shape on the right. They both have the same illumination, but the different geometries make their materials appear to be different. In this part of the thesis, our goal is to study the joint influence of geometry and illumination in our capacity to recognize materials. To do so, we will first gather enough stimuli to test our hypothesis. Then we will use this data to launch several cross-sourced user studies, and then we will analyze our results and draw different conclusions. First, let's start with the data. To launch our user studies, we rely on the data set that we have presented in the first part of the defense. However, in this case, to limit the complexity of the user studies, we select two geometries, Havran on the left and the sphere on the right. They both represent a complex high frequency shape and a smooth surface, respectively. Havran geometry is a shape that has been obtained through optimization techniques. 
in order to cover as many directions as possible of the BRDF. Now, let's move on to the, our usual studies. In our experiments, what we want is to test how humans recognize materials and their different shapes and illuminations. We design an interface that is similar to the one that you can observe now in the screen. Here, the user is presented with a reference material and a group of candidates. And then we ask the users to pick five candidates samples that they believe represent the material in the reference in order of confidence. Then we can evaluate two metrics. The top one accuracy, which considers a valid answer only if the answer correct if the, if the first selection is correct, or the top five accuracy, which considers the trial valid if the correct answer is within the five selected materials. We launch four different configurations of this same user study. In each of them, we vary geometries, the geometries between the reference and the candidate samples. For instance, in the example that you see on the screen, by both of them, reference and candidate being Habran, or by changing the candidates to be spheres, or with the rest of possible combinations. Additionally, the illumination of the reference is randomly picked from the pool of six illuminations. Now, once the experiment is done, we collected more than 9,500 answers. Also, for each of our user experiments, we test out the influence of the following variables. First, we will test out the influence of the reference geometry, the candidate geometry, and also the influence of the reference illumination. Now, let's see the results that we obtain. In this plot here, what we observe is the top five accuracy for each of the reference geometries. Here we see that there is a significant difference between them and that users have obtained a better performance with Habran. The plot on the right shows a very similar result, in this case for the candidate geometry. From those plots, we can observe how, in general, users better recognize materials with Habran geometry, the complex one, irrespective if it is the candidate or the reference geometry. Also here in this plot, what we observe is the top five accuracy for each of the sample illuminations. Here we observe how illuminations with a broadband spectrum form a group with a statistically indistinguishable performance. This is visible on these horizontal lines. Illuminations with a medium frequency content yield worse performance than the latter, and low frequency illuminations are the ones that yield the worst performance of all. From here, we can say that humans better recognize materials with illuminations that feature a broadband frequency spectrum. Now, one potential explanation of this behavior is in the rendering equation. The rendering equation can actually be seen as a convolution between illumination, material, and geometry. Actually, a convolution in the frequency domain is a multiplication of their frequencies. Here, on the left side, we see a toy example of a one-dimensional convolution between geometry and material. We observe that one, when they feature a mix of high and low frequencies, the resulting convolution also features them. On the right side, what we observe is what happened when we convolve one signal with low frequency. Here, the resulting convolution does not keep the high frequency content. This means that if we want to retain the frequencies of the material, the geometry, and the illumination, Sorry, if we want to retain the frequencies of the material, geometry and illumination should have a broadband frequency spectrum that would avoid clamping any of the material frequencies. Now, in addition, we also test if simple statistics, including image histograms or image frequencies, correlate with user answers. We found out that none of them actually correlate. Also, since simple statistics do not correlate, we additionally try if more complex nonlinear models, such as neural networks, do. We take the original data set with all the geometries and illuminations. We leave the Havran shapes for validation and testing purposes. There, we select the ResNet model, which is well known for being accurate in classification tasks, and train it to classify the images of the original data set. Then, we propose an analysis of these high-level visualizations that may suggest that similar high-level factors are used between humans and convolutional neural networks when recognizing materials. 
for additional details on the results obtained, uh, also the results on the simple statistics and on the high level comparison that we perform between the convolutional neural network and human answers, we refer you to the thesis document and the published paper. As a summary, we have presented a systematic user study where we analyze the effect of geometry and illumination in our performance recognizing materials. We analyze how their frequencies affect us and then investigate the rendering equation to find an explanation. Last, we also analyze how simple image statistics and neural networks perform for material recognition and how they correlate with human answers. Now we move into the second part uh, about confounding factors in material perception. Here we analyze the effect of motion in our perception of material appearance. This work has been presented in the Symposium of Applied Perception. We have just seen how geometry and illumination affect our performance recognizing materials. Other important factor that affects the final appearance is motion. So we can see in the screen, when we add motion, the final appearance of a material changes. The reflections or the highlights may blur, and also our perception of it may change. The goal of this part of the thesis is to analyze the impact of linear motion in our perception of high level attributes. To do so, we have created a new dataset with a stimuli under different degrees of motion. We, just, we use them to launch different crowdsourced user studies where participants had to rate in a Likert scale a set of high level attributes such as glossiness. Here, High values means that the item is very glossy and low values mean that the image is no glossy at all. From there, we observe that certain attributes describing how light is reflected undergo a significant change. In this case, the rating is decreased when motion increases. Now we have seen how complex material perception can be. And also at the beginning of the talk, we also saw that actually there is a disconnection between physical parameters and parameters that humans understand. In this third part, the thesis focuses on uh, developing intuitive applications that make manipulating those physical parameters as simple as possible for us. First, we'll start by developing a framework to perform full body human relighting. This part of the thesis has been already presented in the Eurographics Symposium on Rendering. Let's imagine for a second that we are enjoying our holidays with a beautiful landscape. Now we want to take a photo of ourselves, but unfortunately the sun is not in the best position and it casts some backlighting that does not allow us to take the best shot that we could. In this scenario, we would benefit from a post-processing tool that in an automatic or semi-automatic way would allow us to change the lighting in this photograph to obtain a better result. This post-processing step is called relighting. Relighting aims at manipulating or changing the illumination in the scene to a different one while keeping other features of the subject the same. Therefore, our goal here is to create a framework that is capable of performing their lighting process using just a single image where there is a full body human in them. Our framework uses a single RGB image as the input together with the target illumination that is chosen by the user. With this, it is capable of uh, producing a realistic relighting of the input image where the illumination has changed but other features are untouched. This is a challenging goal where we want to perform human relighting in the wild, just from simple images. It is also a highly ill posed problem where factors like geometry, illumination, or materials have to be disambiguated. Before we dive any deeper, let's introduce some background on the relighting problem. This is the rendering equation that we have just seen before, written a bit differently, but essentially the same. In the case of human relighting, what we want is to separate the incoming light from all the other fa factors. Here, we can create a transport term, grouping them all together and change the rendering equation, where now the term L hasn't changed, but T represents the transport. Now, we can use spherical harmonics lighting and pre-computed radium transfer to encode both the incoming light and the transport as coefficients. Here, the letter Y represents the spherical harmonics basis, the value L is their degree, and M is their order. 
This way, if we assume that the order L, that one, is infinite, we can reconstruct the original transport by having a weighted sum between the coefficients of the transport itself and the spherical harmonic spaces. And one would wonder, why do you want to do all these complex spherical harmonics things? So, when we encode the light and the transport using the spherical harmonics, we can transform the rendering equation, where instead of having the complex integral, now we have a dot product between the coefficients of the incoming light and the transport. Now, we can move on to how we develop our framework. First, we will talk about the reflectance model that we use, then we will discuss one of the problems of spherical harmonics, and we will put everything together into our problem formulation. Previous work has modeled the transport coefficients in spherical harmonics, assuming materials to be Lambertian. This way, this dot product that we see here transforms into the following equation, which is nice because it allows us to split between albedo and shading. However, this reflectance model, the Lambertian reflectance model, is limited. Instead, we model our transport using an Oren-Neyer model for the diffuse and a Cook torrance with GGX microfacets for the specular. This way, our transport better captures the directionality of the light and the specular reflections, which is visible in those insets of the figures. While the combination of those reflectance models may not be physically accurate, it actually does allow for additional artistic freedom and is also capable of better fitting real world materials than if we would just use the Lambertian model. Now, let's discuss one of the problems of spherical harmonics. We have mentioned this equation before. It is the equation we use to encode the incoming light into its spherical harmonics coefficients. We have said that with an infinite order of L here, we could reconstruct the original input. But as we observe, we need a very large order of L to be able to reconstruct the high frequency details. Now we have just seen that we can directly reconstruct the image by doing this element wise product between albedo and shading. But to account for errors in spherical harmonics lighting, we additionally introduce a residual term that does not represent a physical quantity and is instead directly learned. Here you can see how the residual term looks like. In this case, it seems to capture the directionality of the light. Now, let's see our problem formulation. Our goal is to relight an image. We can introduce this relighting function that uses the input image and the target illumination to produce the final relighted image. We have seen that for synthetic data, we could directly estimate this relighting function by solving this equation. However, for real photographs, most of the terms are unknown. We introduce a neural network that would take an input image and estimate all those terms that allow us to approximate the relighting function. In order to learn our neural network, we also introduce a new synthetic dataset. Our dataset consists of 525 post-humans. We also gather 266 high dynamic range illuminations that represent a variety of conditions. And we rely on computer graphics, in particular in path tracing and pre-computed radiant transfer algorithms to render the final images. For each scene, we obtain the final image with path tracing, with pre-computed radiant transfer, a mask of the human, a shading map, normal map, albedo map, and an image representing the properties of the materials. In the end, we generate all those maps for almost 140,000 scenes. Now, let's see how we uh, develop our model. Let's recall our final image formulation equation. Here, our goal is to generate from an input image all those intermediate terms that would then allow us to approximate the relighting function. We rely on a convolutional neural network with a shared encoder and several decoders. Each of the decoders is responsible to predict each of the terms in the image reconstruction equation. In the end, once we have them, we can directly approximate the relenting function. But there is one important thing to note here. This value L representing the illumination can be either the target illumination that is given by the user or the illumination of the input scene that is estimated by the model. That means that in our framework, we can rely the input image with a new illumination, but we can also reconstruct the input image if we give the estimated illumination. 
Now, let's see some of the results that we obtain. We have seen that we can reconstruct the original input. Here, we do a proof of concept reconstructing a photograph taken from online sources. Here, first, we have to compute and remove the mask from the input image. Here, what we can observe is the reconstruction of our model. We can see how our method achieves a faithful reconstruction of the input image, and it also yields a very low L2 per pixel error. Also, we observe how our method is capable of producing a plausible albedo, shading, and residual. However, since this is a real image, we do not know what is the ground truth albedo, shading, or residual. Also, so far, what we have seen is a result reconstructing the input image. Here in this video, what we observe is a relighted result using a new light. Here, the input are also real photographs that are downloaded from online sources. We can see how the method captures the geometry of the humans and also produces a realistic looking relighting according to the new given illumination. As a summary, we have presented a framework that is capable of relighting a single image with a human in them. We propose to better model the reflectance of materials in our data, and also we have introduced a new residual term in our image formulation equation that leads to improved reconstructions. Now, in the last topic of this thesis, we also propose an intuitive application. In this case, we propose an application to easily manipulate the appearance of materials in images. This work has been referred to the Computer Graphics Forum, where it is currently under review. This is the image that we have seen at the beginning of the defense. There we motivated how complex material appearance can be. Now, let's say that instead of wanting to measure how similar two materials are, we would like to edit the materials of uh, the table in the image. Let's say that we want to modify it to be metallic. This is not easy. If we recall, appearance of a material is actually de described by a complex mathematical function. Those functions are hard to interpret and to understand, and usually only experienced users, like artists, really know how they can be manipulated. Instead, a non-experienced user would benefit from an approach where using just simple methods, he would be capable to manipulate the appearance of the, of the final material. Our goal here is therefore to develop a framework to allow for intuitively editing of material just from single images. Given an input image, such as the plastic toy of the Seahawk, and a user rating that defines the change in appearance, we want to design a framework that is capable of producing a new image keeping illumination and geometry constant, but changing the material according to the user rating. One important thing to take into account here is that we aim at a framework that works with single images, and we do not aim to use pairs of images that are edited and not edited. Now, first, let's talk about the data. We rely on the data set that has been introduced at the beginning of the talk, containing several different geometries, illuminations, and materials. Since we do not use pairs of edited images, we collect high-level material attribute ratings that will be later used to learn the editing framework. We launch cross-sourced user studies where participants rate how, rate how glossy or metallic the material in an image is. We selected these two high-level attributes because they are common for describing appearance. In the end, more than 2,600 participants took place in the user studies. Now, let's see how we develop our framework. From the data set, we have a set of images together with the ratings that we just collected online. Also, we have the desired change in appearance, in this case provided by the user. And last, we obtain the target image where we want to arrive at. One direct approach would be to create a generative neural network and directly input the editing value B to it. However, Using this model results in an edited image that lacks geometric details and does not show any metallic highlights. It overall lacks realism. One possible solution is to add the surface normals as the input. This change allows us to have a better result where geometric details are actually preserved and realism is overall achieved. 
However, there is still some blurriness in the highlights of the editing result. Our final model is a two network architecture, where the first network is the deep network that we have just seen that is capable of effectively changing the appearance of the material. The second network is a much shallower model whose main goal is to keep high frequency details while refining the edit of the first network. The final result is an image that better produces the color of the original input, better preserves high frequency details in the geometry, and overall produces a more realistic looking result. Now, let's see what are the results that we obtain. Here we have two images. The one on the left was taken with our, with our phone and the one on the right was downloaded from online catalogs. Let's say now that we want to increase the metallicity on the one on the left and decrease it from the one on the right. Those are the results that we obtain from our framework. The one on the left effectively looks more metallic, while the one on the right now looks much less metallic with a plastic-like appearance. On the right side, we observe what happens when we edit the glossy attribute. In this case, the pink alpaca now has some glossy reflections, while the plastic seahorse now looks more like a rubbery seahorse. As a summary here, we have collected additional ratings on high-level material attributes. Using those ratings, we develop an architecture that integrates such, such perceptual information and that it does not need pairs of images edited and not edited. In the end, we have developed an intuitive edit, editing framework for material appearance that requires just a single image as the input. Now, as a summary, in this thesis, we have started talking about how to measure mm, appearance similarity. We started discussing how to use deep learning models for measuring material appearance similarity, and then move into the non-photorealistic domain of icons. In the second section, we talk about how confounding factors affect our perception of material appearance. We started by analyzing the joint influence of geometry and illumination in material perception, and then analyze the influence of motion in our perception of high-level attributes. In the third part, we proposed several intuitive applications for appearance editing. First, we saw how we can perform the human relighting process. And in the last part, we saw how we can intuitively edit material appearance just from single images. Also, in this part of the thesis, we have seen how powerful deep learning can be when it's combined with subjective judgments. We have seen how this allows to create models that better represent or better correlate with the human notion of material appearance. In the second part of the thesis, we also did an analysis where we uh, uh, investigated the influence of or the correlation between convolutional neural networks and human behavior. While neural networks are indifferent to biological plausibility, they are the closest models that we know to human behavior. Also, some people argue that they serve a very similar uh, scheme as the human visual cortex does. And probably investigating deeper into them and how, what the connections are with human perception is interesting. Also, in the third part, we have seen that deep neural networks are a great optimization toolbox. They are capable of learning complex problems, such as what is the interaction between light and matter, and then they are also able of proposing or they are capable of proposing intuitive solutions for us. Many challenges still lie ahead. This thesis has tried to tackle a set of problems that represent a small step or a very, very small portion of what remains to be done. We have seen that in many cases, we have been working on restricted problems, like either it was single objects or maybe they were single color. Anyways, developing framework that aim at more general solutions is something that still there remains to be done. Also, during the development of this thesis, we have experimented the course of dimensionality. This is especially visible when you launch user studies, right? Because you have different variables that you want to sample, but if you sample from all of them, then you need millions or billions of answers, and this is unfeasible. Maybe this course of dimensionality is also related to how we represent scenes. Nowadays, scenes are represented as a combination of geometry, material, and illumination. Maybe finding alternative representation is key to advance here. 
for instance, I'm thinking of NERV, where they actually integrate geometry, illumination, and material into just one value, and they have had such an amazing success. And also, it remains to see how we can combine everything we have been talking about to develop different authoring tools and software. How can we bring uh, all this discussion that we have had to the people? How can we may create more intuitive tools, easy to use, and also efficient to be used? I also wanted to add here a more personal note. I wanted to say that those four years for like four days, when you enjoy what you do, time flies. Also, I wanted to say thanks because the PhD is a huge opportunity. It has allowed me to be abroad for more than nine months, in this case in Adobe Research. And it has also allowed me to stay on the other side of the world, in this case by teaching and supervising students. Also during this PhD, I was able to collaborate and meet with, different, with people with different backgrounds and from different parts of the world, which I think also strengthens your soft skills. And last, I wanted to also mention about reproducible research. As much as we could, we try to always uh, public and make freely available our code and our data sets so people can build on it. Last, I wanted to thank uh, Belen and Diego, my PhD supervisor, for this huge opportunity, the committee of this thesis defense for being here and agreeing of being all this time uh, during the defense. And also I wanted to thank my family also for being listening to me all this time, even though probably they don't understand much. And now I would take uh, questions. Okay. Uh, thank you for this very nice, inspiring and very clear also presentation. <clears throat> uh, so now we'll have time for questions. Uh, and we'll start from the spokesperson, Roma. Uh, yeah, please start with your with with your questions. Thanks. Uh, so first, uh, yeah, I wanted to thank you too for this very nice presentation. Uh, it was really interesting, uh, very clear, and uh, the the amount of work is remarkable <laughs> that you made, uh, and it it's also very nice that you render it public to make it uh, mm -hmm. available for everybody. I think it will be inspiring for a lot of research. Um, of course, I have uh, some questions. I will try to not be too long, so maybe I will uh, uh, begin with the general ones. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so let's uh, let's start with um, uh, with uh, the, the correlations you are talking about in your. I, I'm not an expert in uh, mm. deep learning, right? So of course, I will ask questions about that <laughs> and. Uh, so all along your manuscript, you are, you are saying that simple image statistics do not correlate with uh, human per perceptions, with, which I agree with, actually. Mm -hmm. But there I think there is also a gap between the small amount of um, uh, parameters that, that you can find in simple image statistics, a few yeah. ones, and thousands of <laughs> hundreds of thousands that, that you can have in uh, deep learning approaches. Mm -hmm. So I would like your opinion about that. Uh, what do you think? Is there uh, can there be some compromises or in between? What do you think? Yeah. So well, it's clear that pixel differences will hardly correlate with human perception. We actually during part of the thesis we also tried these more simple models, like for example support vector machines or things like that, would actually correlate with user answers. We found out that they do not correlate. And even when you move up to uh, highly nonlinear models, let's say deep learning, when you have thousands of parameters, you can find that there is some correlation in some specific tasks. But there is still a lot to be done. And we know that, okay, neural networks are actually, they don't care about how our brain works, right? Mm -hmm. they, they just work. When we know that is the best model that we have for recognition. But I don't think it's the model that will be able to explain how perception works. I, that, that's my point. It's probably better than the previous, but it will it will not be the the model that closes the problem. I don't know if that's a connection. Yeah, so I have a related question actually because yeah. you you are citing also a paper a lot a paper from Roland Fleming who yeah. made um, neural networks to in type in psychophysics in order to uh, 
to uh, to learn the how how we how we see stuff. I think something I, I didn't read the paper in, the, in detail, but I mean you are citing psychophysics paper about that about this non correlation this non linear correlation sector. Yeah, and uh, I was saying okay if you say that there is no simple way of uh, finding links between the physical link, the, the physical properties of what is what we see in the images mm -hmm. and what we see, then what do you think about, about psychophysics, which is exactly what the, the research that is trying to do that, yeah, finding so the links between physics and the visual perception. So is it the end of psychophysics? <laughs> so I, I think I know the paper you are talking about is, uh, I think it's Catherine Storrs, Roland Fleming, and probably some other authors. I'm missing. Yeah, yeah, right. They are training a model in an unsupervised fashion, and they find out that it's capable of predicting gloss perception and misperception, mm. both. So that's what I'm trying to say. Probably neural networks is something that, if you train for a specific task, can correlate for these tasks, only for that. So in this case, uh, Roland and colleagues, found that when they train a model in a supervised fashion, it's capable of correlating with loss. But if you move it to another task, it will probably fail. Mm. In this point is that, yeah, probably neural networks is the model that we find correlate the most with human perception, in this case for gloss perception. If you move something to something, some other task, it may not be the case. So there is still something there that needs to be done. We need to find uh, maybe more accurate models or models that better represent how our visual system works. So cool. yeah, I, I think Roland is right when investigating those things, because they are definitely the way to go. It's the best recognition model that we can, or computational model that we can actually use. And mm -hmm. it's the model that we believe correlates the most with the human visual system, but there is still a, a gap. Yeah, sure, but this is really interesting, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me check. So reg regarding the evaluation of deep learning approaches, um, this is also interesting to me because I don't know very well, sorry. <laughs> but, no uh, so usually a common strategy for that is to do actually ablation studies, right? This is what you do all along your manuscript too. Yeah. Uh, and this is very nice because, uh, of course, it shows that your network is the best mm -hmm. one. Yeah. But I'm not sure that if it really tells if this network is the best one. I mean, do, I mean, it shows that if you remove some stuff in your network, it works better. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't say that your work, uh, your network is the best that you could mm -hmm. have designed for that. So, uh, are there alternatives to that, or how do you how do you evaluate that? I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I would put the evaluation in three steps, kind of. No, like um, first you can do ablation studies. This will prove that the architecture that you have chosen is correct, no? Because you remove pieces, see what performance you get, and at the sure. end you mm. find out that when you add the pieces that you need to add, it works the best. This is the first attempt. Then another attempt that you should do is to compare with previous work, no? Like this will tell you if you are actually the best. One. And also another step that we do also along the thesis is that because we are working on perceptual tasks. No one is going to tell you better how you work than humans. So you can launch user studies and see how your model performs compared to humans. Are we on par with them? Are we worse? Are we better? And I think you have to combine the three of them. Maybe if you are working on a very well-established, uh, I don't know, image classification and a very well-known database, mm -hmm. maybe you can already avoid the part of uh, launching user studies because you already have a lot of related work that will tell you, look, this neural network performs at 99% accuracy and is better than humans. So there, you probably do not need to launch user studies. But in our case, since we were working on problems related to perception, I think the validation consisted of these three steps. Doing ablation studies to show that the architecture that you have actually makes sense. Uh, also performing some um, comparisons with previous work and last, validating your model with uh, human answers. OK. Hmm. Um, one question about uh, the, the, the design of uh, the data sets. OK. Um, so you, usually, you also rely on uh, mechanical Turk uh, mm -hmm. in order to get plenty of sensors. And 
So I, I, I understand that on average, you will get um, good answers, basically. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I was wondering if or for, for such a precise task that is evaluating material property, such as, mm. I don't know, uh, brightness on, on different screens that have very uh, different uh, gamut, or I don't know, can it be a problem? Can it introduce some bias? Uh, I mean, do mm. you? I'm not sure. And a related question about that is, for instance, for the first, uh, for, for your first work where you have um, 90,000 images and uh, you, you design some, um, I mean, you didn't compare all the images themselves, right? So you made some important sampling and etc. So mm -hmm. I was also wondering if it could also be part of introducing bias in the results or not. And I would like to you to mm -hmm. talk a bit about that. Okay, so regarding to use Amazon mechanical tour or doing an in-house experiment, this is a conversation that we have had every time we wanted to launch user studies. Mm. Because at the end, it's a compromise between, I don't know, 50 samples, but very high quality sample, or 50,000 with average quality. So it's a bit with, a bit similar to what you said, no? At the end is the law of big numbers. Like at the end, you will have one that will perform above average. You will have one that will perform below average. But at the end, since you have many samples, they will all of them perform fine in the end. No, it's true. This may introduce some bias because you don't have control on the parameters. But since you have so many answers, I think that the ones that have introduced bias plus the ones that do not introduce the bias at the end, like uh, filter out, let's say. And on your second question, your second question was about the. Uh, it was about uh, the important sampling uh, that yeah. you have done. Okay. So on the important sampling, there what we were doing is a method to see how much information we can get from each of the samples. It's impossible to sample triplets from 9,000 yeah, sure. samples yeah. because you would have billions or trillions of possible triplets. So there what we were doing is to see which class has not been sampled or from which class we don't have information. By doing an iterative process that consisted on launching the user studies, analyzing the, the information gain that each sample would give us, and repeating this process. In that sense, I don't think it introduces bias. I think it's a method that just basically allows you to sample more precisely the space that if you would do just a complete random. Mm, okay. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay. Maybe I have a bit of time for more specific questions then. I will okay. take it. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, re regarding your work, on uh, confounding factors. Yeah. Um, I was wondering when I when I read your your paper uh, if only if, if the use of only two geometries were sufficient to test the frequency of the shape actually because if I look at the sphere and at the other object the Avran one. Mm -hmm. It seems that for me, I mean, the sphere, of course, has a very low frequency, but the Avran seems to have uh, high frequencies plus the sphere too. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I was wondering, uh, can we really say that the Avran object is only high frequency? And can we say we, we have a low, we have a high, and then uh, uh, conclude on this one? Yeah. So this was also the discussion we had, also because it's the, the course of dimensionality, no? Like if we would add a new, uh, like, like now we had four user studies. If we had a new geometry, we would have to go to nine. And this is a combinatorics number that just grows forever, right? Yeah. So there we supported ourselves also in previous work. There is this work of Van Gorp and so on, that they saw how the blob can also manipulate and also be a good point, no? And there we, we base our claims on what we observe ourselves, but also on what previous work has observed, had observed. Also based on the paper of Habran itself, where they also find out that they seem to be a bit better. Okay. So and, uh, in, yeah, sorry. In that sense, um, I tried to summarize in the presentation, but in the, um, in the document, in the thesis or in the paper itself, we try to also di dive a bit deeper, not only of on the influence of geometry or on the influence of illumination, but also on their joint interaction. 
and also do well explain a bit more the analysis that we do later on on the frequencies and all these kind of things yeah but i i, I actually really liked your dis discussion on frequencies between geometry illumination and mm -hmm. uh, the perception of material and i also have a related question about the environment actually <laughs> about the environment about the lighting environment right okay uh on the same experiment so you show that when the environment contain low frequency content like the glacier one uh, then the perception of material is lower i mean is yeah. bad yeah we we recognize worst yeah I, and i was wondering it, if it was really true actually because um because you only have one low frequency environment in your experiment mm -hmm. so if you had plenty of low i mean if on average you had uh, the same amount of low frequency environment and the same amount of high frequency environment then if you if you look at one object with a low frequency environment uh, as a reference and if there is the same object uh, with a low frequency environment in the candidates mm -hmm. then you will tend of course to select the same one right and you will be right in mm -hmm. that case and uh, mm -hmm. i was wondering if uh, by select by being sure that you have the same amount of environment and geometries of course then maybe the results could have been more homogeneous. Uh, I'm not sure. Mm. Maybe. I mean, it would have been nice to have uh, extra illuminations there to test out all possible hypotheses. But uh, what we observed is that when, for example, with Glacier, Glacier is actually a cloudy day. So if you have there a cloudy day where basically the radiance values are almost constant yeah. and you have a chrome sphere, you actually just you basically see the chrome sphere instead of being gray and reflecting what it reflects a bit more blue in this case yeah. because it's glacier no mm -hmm. and what this does effectively is that you are looking at the chrome sphere which is actually a very uh glossy material and you actually see it more like i would say diffuse yeah because you only see the reflection so I think that the users were performing worse because at the end with the low frequency environment materials that were diffuse still look diffuse and materials that were specular now were also looking diffuse yes so when they had to pick from that's where they failed i um, agree it would have been better to have a perfectly sample of each of the variables but this was uh, it was a bit complex because at the end it makes the the test uh, unfeasible no because at the end you have to render lunch much sure, more sure. thousands of experiments <laughs> and so on I, I understand this is a massive experiment, yeah. <laughs> but I was wondering because I really like the, 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 the relationships between, between the frequencies of the geometry and the environment. And I'm pretty sure that you could find some links between the amount of frequencies between the environment, mm -hmm. the amount of frequencies in the, in the geometry, yeah. and the relative perception of material at the, at the end. Mm -hmm. so maybe there is something, I mean, which is not a very simple statistic. But yeah, that's right. also not uh, hundreds of one, you know. <laughs> you, I mean, you you may be able to find uh, links with your networks too. Yeah. I mean, uh, by I don't know, uh, reducing the dimensionality of your results. So I, I don't know something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is really interesting for that too. Yeah. Uh, okay, maybe a last one, and then I will leave uh, for the others because. <laughs> Perfect um so regarding the human body relating which is really impressive mm -hmm. actually i was wondering uh, uh why only human body photos <laughs> so what okay. is the specificity of human bodies compared to any kind of objects no i think that the framework itself could be trained with any object we just choose the case of full body humans because it's well known uh, mm -hmm. and i think it's well, you could, you could do relighting of anything. The thing is that you, at the end, have to choose one topic because at the end is what you are going to put through your neural network, right? If you try to make a model that is too general, your neural network will fail. So you have to, in this case, choose something that is more or less similar. And at the end, humans, they can have different poses, but the shape remains constant, kind of. Kind of. And the end, that, that, that was the choice. Is what we were talking also at the end of the PhD, the defense, that 
at the end of looking for more general solutions is something that remains to be done. And in the case of relighting, people has done it by doing uh, several photos, like the, maybe they do six photos around the object, and from there you can gather the geometry. But in the case of single images, it's way harder. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I understand. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think I will leave uh, my place now and <laughs> let the others ask. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, so <clears throat> thank you, Roma, for your questions. So now it's time for Anna. Do you have some questions, remaining questions? Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> so first, thanks a lot for the nice presentation and, and congratulations for, for all this great work. Um, so I, I have a bunch of questions. Um, so I'll try to go from, so instead from general to specific, I kind of have them in order of appearance in the okay. sense, like for topics, right? Um, so the first one I was wondering because so for, um, Appearance similarity, um, you collect triplets, right? And then you use a triplet loss function. Um, and then if I understood correctly for the icons problem, you also have a kind of similar scheme, right? You also have triplets. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's different, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, the kind of data you collect, uh, it's or the kind of uh, function you use is more or less uh, also for, for triplets, right? Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I was wondering because for, for materials, um, you use ResNet and then for the icons, you use the Siamese network. Yeah. Um, so just out of curiosity, I was wondering uh, what's the reason behind this, these different choices? Could the ResNet support the icons mm -hmm. or could the Siamese network support the material appearance similarity? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, there are few differences between both words. One is that the, the loss function in the material similarity is a bit more advanced, a bit more complex, a bit more custom made. And also that in the materials one, we learn the triplets, the distances, are learned according to human answers, while in icons, they are sampled from semantic information. So this is not perceptually related. What happened is in the icons, uh, when we were developing this method, ResNet was just out of the box. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that we, we didn't have a chance to try it. Okay, and so then, it's just a matter of, of let's say, yeah, uh, one was maybe. before the other, right? Okay. Exactly. So what we did is, uh, in the end, we created a Siamese neural network that was tailored for our problem. And we put the layers manually by ourselves instead of relying on the ResNet architecture and retraining. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I see. And um, so, of course, uh, one would need to try, right? But do you think... <laughs> Um, by using this more advanced ResNet, um, you could maybe improve what you got from the, the icons uh, yeah. project? So I think it could potentially improve, but slightly. One of the problems, one of the, um, how to call it, the um, drawbacks of the icon uh, problem was the data. Mm -hmm. Here, the data, we had icons, and each icon is paired with semantic information that is given by the artist, right? So, for example, maybe an artist is designing something with a thick line, and then it's called a thick line. Then perfect, because you have uh, semantic information that says thick line, and another icon set is thin line. And then they have different style and identity, and then the network will learn perfectly. The problem is that there is noise, because there are some people that develop houses with different styles, and they call them house. Mm -hmm. Right, and other one will do cars with different styles and call it cars. There, since we are sampling the triplets from the semantic labels, we will have a problem because we can at the end have cars that have a similar style not being properly learned by the network or the same with houses. So there the bias or the problem comes from the data itself. I think the ResNet model would be able to better uh, model the, the, the triplets that we sample. But the question I think here would be how much does the triplets that we sample correlate with human perception? Because at the end, it may be that at the style, in the style, information on the style is not encoded in the semantic information on the, of the labels. And you may be learning something wrong. That's why we did an additional validation step to see how much it was correlating with human answers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I see. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. So now I have a couple questions for the um, full body human relating project. Sure. Um, so one, it's kind of an open ended question. So I, I was wondering whether 
um, this because mo most of the results I saw are kind of uh, how do I say this uniform in terms of skin shades. Um, have you tried, or do you know if it would work for different skin shades? So we it, it works to some extent. When we were developing the data set, uh, it's a very like I don't know implementation detail that I didn't mention during the talk, but we download 3D humans online, right? And there you have textures, like you have the 3D geometry, usually represented as an OBJ, but you also have textures that represent the material itself. And there you have skin, you have cloth, you can... In the texture of the skin, we actually applied a modifier to have different color appearances. Mm -hmm. But we could have improved it way more, way more, because we didn't go to the extremes. Okay, so it's a matter of training data. Right, it's so a matter you... of training okay. data because by default, what you download is usually uh, white skin. Mm -hmm. We did apply this modifier by looking into different skin colors online and mm -hmm. apply this slight modifier. But as I'm saying, it works to some extent, but it also may fail, and we should consider extra uh, components in the data in order for it to perfectly work in all type of skins. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... So, but, but if you would have the training data, uh, I, I, I guess it would generalize, right? It would not. Exactly. Uh, okay. It In line with what Ryan said, if you have uh, objects, mm -hmm. it would work with objects. Mm -hmm. It's just a general framework. It depends on the data in this case. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So I have one more question regarding this uh, project. So mm -hmm. at some point, um, so it says that the, the network is fully convolutional, so it allows inputs of arbitrary resolution. But then when I look at the results, they are kind of, um, I mean, they have a nice resolution, but I wouldn't say they are super high resolution. So it, is this a matter of computation time? So what would happen if I try to input like a super yeah. high resolution image? It would be just longer or maybe details if you, so it would also depend on the training data, right? Because if the training data does not have super high resolution, maybe the network does not learn to reproduce yeah. these, these very fine details. Yeah, so you almost answered the question. Okay. <laughs> it's computation, right? We were using, the model at the end is like a very, very big model. We were using a very huge machine to train that and spend days for training. One problem here was the hardware itself. I think the input was around 512 by 256, something like that. And you could input whatever. And each image has a different uh, input resolution because they are cropped to the mask of the human, right? So the resolution is arbitrary. But at the end, let's say that we were training uh, with images that on average were 512 by 256. If you then want to input your image 2K by 500, something like that, what will happen is that the resolution that the model will output will be good, will be the same one, but what it will be, will, what it will be predicting will be a bit more blurry. Mm -hmm. And also sometimes you may have some artifacts. So it's resolution independent, but mm -hmm. due to hardware constraints, we could not input images of 2K resolution and images of 512. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so yes. if you have like a, one of these huge machineries from uh, Google or NVIDIA or something. Then you can. Okay, mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> as big as you want. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so now I have a couple more questions regarding the last part uh, of intuitive material editing. Sure. Um, so maybe I missed it. This I'm not sure. So um, did you collect that data for, because I, I, I've seen that you have uh, examples with glossy and metallicness. Or metal, glossy and metallic. Did mm -hmm. you collect data for other attributes? Or, or, yeah. or, you collected the data. No, we didn't collect oh, okay. the data. Okay. So, okay. but <laughs> we collected yes for glossy and metallic. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we proposed a general framework where you mm -hmm. could, ideally, if you want the math uh, attribute, you collect the math attribute, and the framework works. Mm -hmm. The idea is that the framework works per attribute. So mm -hmm. you train your model. Your model is capable of editing metallicity, metallic. Mm -hmm. And then you train your model, you can edit glossy. You train your model, you can edit uh, math. Mm -hmm. At some point, we were wondering what would happen if we have a full description. Let's say we have a vector that describes appearance. And there we have 
several attributes like uh, metallic, glossy, matte, uh, strength of reflections, all these sort of high level attributes that uh, would describe a material, right? Mm -hmm. So we were wondering what would happen if instead of predicting a single attribute, we would predict this vector. Would it work better or not? But it's already a future work thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So I, I, because I'm wondering what would happen, so let's say, um, Let's imagine we have like a sphere or something like mm -hmm. kind of smooth or like like a Christmas ball, right? Okay. Um, so the thing is, when you make something uh, glossier, or maybe if it's like a plastic no, but if it's kind of a mirror-like material, when you make it um, more metallic, at some point it may start, especially if the if it's it it has kind of um, um, sharp reflections, at some point it may start reflecting the environment map. But then if you start it from a very rough material, which is very matte, you don't have such uh, environment map. So what would happen? Th does it reflect something or, or is it kind of um, mm -hmm. um, metallic-ish, but you cannot clearly see the environment or what would happen in this kind of case? So yeah, th that is just what you said. When you have a very reflective item, you have information on the illumination. When the item is very diffuse, this information of the illumination is lost. And mm -hmm. we actually are not proposing an inverse rendering approach. Mm -hmm. We are just proposing an image to image approach where it has to implicitly learn the information of the illumination. Mm -hmm. What happens when we make it more metallic is that we make something that looks more like brass aluminum. Uh -huh. I see. <laughs> and it, it doesn't, it's not capable of producing sharp highlights. It's capable of producing highlights that are coherent with the current illumination. It mm -hmm. keeps the directionality, it keeps the color, it keeps those things, but it's not uh, it's not super precise in the sense of it's not extremely high frequency accurate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, is... it, it makes sense. At the end, you don't know what's there. I mean, for if you have an input image in which the environment map mm -hmm. is not reflecting anywhere, there's, I mean, you should yeah. have to fully uh, hallucinate that. There's nothing... Exactly. Yep. It's a high yield post problem, and uh, basically the model cannot invent yep. an illumination out of itself. It can create the features that, to our perception, make it look more metallic, mm -hmm. but it's not, I mean, it, it fills its purpose, which is creating a more metallic appearance, but it doesn't create a super smooth metallic surface, mm -hmm. more okay. like brass aluminum. Yep, yep, it makes sense, yes. Okay, so I think, um, well, maybe one more question, sort of question. So in this, uh, also in this project, um, you had one response for each condition because there's, it's again, it's like a huge uh, dimensionality, there's shape, illumination, material viewpoint, right? In which project, sorry? And there's this uh, intuitive material editing. Yeah. Okay, so you collected data uh, and at some point, um, you pull the perceptual ratings over viewpoint and shape. Exactly. Okay. Um, so are they actually consistent for different viewpoints and shapes? Did you check? Yeah. So what we were checking is that, um, well, we collected for each viewpoint, shape, uh, geometry, and illumination, we collected this data. Mm -hmm. But at training time, in order to have a more homogeneous uh, answer, what we did is to uh, get the median between the different viewpoints. Because at the end, we had only one answer per viewpoint because of the course of dimensionality, if you mm -hmm. have 45,000 samples. But if you want to have 10 answers per uh, sample, it's, important. Well, it's unfeasible in a short amount of time or a reasonable amount of time. So what we did is to collect one answer per viewpoint. And that, mm -hmm. at the end, gives five answers per geometry, material, and illumination. Mm -hmm. In order to have a pooled average, uh, more kind of stable answer, we compute the median over the different viewpoints. And this is what we later use to train the model. Mm -hmm. OK, so I guess it's, let's say, good enough for this application that does not be to be super precise, but there could be still differences in the data, right, for different viewpoints, especially if the viewpoints mm -hmm. are very large, right? Yes. So mm -hmm. we, we try to sample the viewpoints on a 45 uh, cone, let's say, mm -hmm. from the center of the object. There is still some difference. And I guess if you would like to develop an application that mm -hmm. uh, would take into account the different viewpoints, then you would have to sample more data per viewpoint in order yes. to have a more informed answer. Because it can be that you have a, 
what we, what we wanted to avoid is that, okay, we have one answer and this person was not paying attention and has answered that is the most glossy it could be when it's something super rough. Yes. This is an outlier. So if you have four other answers that are correct, and you take the medium at the mm -hmm. end, that one will filter out. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing we wanted to avoid in this case. So if you want to work in a project that viewpoints are actually something important, you should probably have to pull more answers per viewpoint or, mm -hmm. or you will have noise in your data, basically. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm done with my turn of questions. So Piotr, you can. Yes. Yep. So thank you, Anna, for the questions. So yeah. So now it's my turn to ask you some questions, Manuel. Perfect. So yeah, first of all, thank you for your presentation again. It was really great. And you know, all the, your contributions uh, are very nice. And I think, you know, they are very inspiring. And, you know, I was following your work for some time already. And, you know, they, I think they are also inspiring my research in, you know, many projects that we have. So I think yeah. this is, you know, it's really nice and, you know, hopefully in the future we'll see even more works that follow kind of your ideas that you present in your papers Thanks. now uh, regarding the the, the questions uh, well some of them were already answered uh, <laughs> so but i will start you know i will try to ask some you know different ones so Perfect. coming back to this uh, you know problem of running those experiments with mechanical turks right like so the, there is like with mechanical turks you like you of course get a lot of data right which is nice yeah. especially for training your neural networks but do you kind of did you investigate like what's the you know at which point it actually pays off because the problem with this mechanical turks is that you have a lot of you potentially can get a lot of unreliable data right which i don't know did you did you filter them somehow or yeah. you didn't? So this is one issue, right? And on the other hand, you can try to run those very massive also experiments in person and you get more reliable uh, mm -hmm. kind of data. So like, do you kind of have some intuition like where, at which point it pays off and at which, doesn't, mm -hmm. does, at which point it doesn't pay off to use mechanical text for this kind of experiments? Yeah. So, yeah, one thing we were doing is to include some kind of fake questions that we later used to see if the user is actually mm -hmm. paying attention or not. So mm -hmm. you, you have put something extremely simple that everyone would know the answer and you see how many people has answered it correctly. If you put five of those over 50 trials and you see that someone has failed on all of them, you clearly know they are not paying attention, mm -hmm. right? And that that's that's something obvious. This helps you to clean your data, but it doesn't guarantee that your data is perfectly clean. I mean, it's, no, it's still not uh, free of bias. So this is one thing we do. And also regarding what is the, the point where you want to the, either go for an in-house experiment or go mm -hmm. to mechanical tour to gather more data, I think it would depend on the problem. In our case, we were developing problems where most of the times what we were doing was basically training a model from scratch because maybe there was uh, nothing that was had, had worked before with deep learning in this problem or things like that. If you need to train something from scratch where there is no previous model that has been successful on it, most probably you will need lots of data and you would go through mechanical tour most probably. There is the case that if a model already works, then you can probably do an experiment in house, collect less samples mm -hmm. and already then uh, try to, instead of training from scratch, fine tune in the already trained model with your new data and see what you would get. If you still get results that are not accurate, you know it already doesn't work well. But also another solution, like it's maybe something in between and that is sometimes used on medical imaging and so on. Like for example, when you have a, I think it's called CT scan, like this kind of 3D scan of your body and so on, you cannot get those very easily unlabeled because uh, you actually need lots of time, you need a doctor there and it's super expensive. So what people was doing is to train generative models to be able to generate those. I don't know to what extent you could be able to train an intermediate model that would, from your very perfectly clean data that you have gathered in house, generate extra samples that you would later use to train your full model. Mm -hmm. This is something that has been successfully applied for medical imaging, also for eye tracking. And I guess if it's been uh, successfully applied in those fields, it could also be successfully applied here. So like sort of like a smart data augmentation, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. like a complex one because you have to mm -hmm. actually train a generative network to generate all mm -hmm. this data. Yeah. 
Okay. So yeah. So following on this question, so uh, uh, if you were to run, you know, if so, you you did all those experiments for modeling the appearance uh, of objects that are rendered, that are shown on the yeah. screen. So now, how would you approach the problem of, you know, modeling the perception of real objects <laughs> in the, you know, in the real world? So obviously like running, you know, <laughs> mechanical Turk, that might be a bit of an issue, uh, but still maybe you would like to get a, you know, maybe similar model because maybe the, the perception of the objects on the screen doesn't match exactly what we, you know, we would see on th in, in the real world because, you know, it's just like how we aggregate the information, what kind of cues mm -hmm. we are using for uh, <clears throat> distinguishing between materials. This works very differently. So how would you approach this, this problem? And do you think yeah. of any way that your current work, like whatever you presented here might be useful for, you know, studying the perception of the materials and developing these sort of metrics for, for the real environments? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, well, actually, if you work in a real environment, it's like all the online tools are kind of filtered out now because there you have 2D images. I wonder to what extent you could do something like, okay, look, I'm going to run an in-house experiment, 50 people, 20 people, as many as I can. I put the object, they have to rate it, and I have the in-house experiment with real-life objects. Then I'm going to try to replicate this experiment in mechanical torque. I put them five photos of the same object so they can have the 3D uh, mental view of the object in their brain and see what are the results. There we could see if there is some agreement or correlation and actually see if mechanical tour can actually hold something similar, right? Other option would be to move into VR. Maybe there is more people that has VR that is outside of the, uh, of the office of the university and you could run these large scale studies just by requiring a VR device. Mm -hmm. At the end, VR is something like in between, you know, this single image and the full 3D in-person image. So maybe something in between could be a mm -hmm. potential solution there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, so. Um, okay. Oh, I forgot about the, the works. Uh, I don't know if the work could be directly applied, but I think the work would benefit from it, no? right? Because right, right now we are basing many of our things, assuming that a 2D image is representing the full human perception when it's not true. I mean, at the end, the full human perception is represented by many senses, even smell or mm -hmm. touch. Right. What I wonder is how things would change if users would see it. Like, would the metric behave differently? Would we see the materials differently if we were in the environment where we can look around, see what's our illumination, and so on? So, uh, I'm not sure, or I don't know at least at this moment, how the work could be applied to obtain the data, but I know that this data pulled from a real 3D environment. Mm -hmm. could be used to improve the work. Yeah, I was wondering whether you can, because yeah, collecting this data for a real environment is, you know, much more difficult because you don't have this kind of digital tools to yeah. run the experiment. I was wondering, you know, learning, you know, gaining this data from scratch, so that, you know, sounds, sounds complicated, but I was wondering whether there would be a possibility to kind of try to figure out the delta which the real environment adds at top of what you already have, right? So hmm. maybe do you think that would be easier to essentially, you know, instead of studying from scratch the, you know, the perception of appearance in the real world, like study the difference between the perception in the real world versus the versus the screen and then sort of like use this delta, you mm -hmm. know, kind of add the delta mm -hmm. at top of what you already developed, right? Yeah, I, I think that's super interesting. And it, a priori, it sounds like something simpler, not that yes, instead of fully developing uh, something completely new, you just aim at finding the, the differences between what exists mm -hmm. and the new thing. I think this is something super interesting. Okay, so let me just, okay, I'm done with that. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to ask you one question about this metric for icons. Sure. So this is that your method works for for rasterized representation of the icons, right? So you take a, images. In the, in the end. It's a single yeah, yeah, so it's a rasterized format. Mm -hmm. Do you think there would be any benefit to 
to represent to use the vectorized you know vector based representation of the those icons and try to learn on such representation would that be more beneficial like mm -hmm. i don't know i was just curious because i thought that like a lot of those icons when they are designed they are actually designed in vector graphics right yeah. so you assume that you take a vector graphics and you when you rasterize it and then you do your business right and maybe this is also what you had the data for right because i think you you wrote that you which you downloaded a viable data set of icons, right? Yeah. So that's also how they uh, are made available. But do you think there can be potentially a, you know, benefit of learning on the vector-based representation? And would there be some difficulty in doing this? Well, the vectorized representation, I think, would be better in the sense that with the vectorized representation, you have a resolution layers uh, representation that potentially can encode even more information than what you have, yes, in the pixels, right? And at the end, it's the natural format of icons. Mm -hmm. uh, something we discussed at the beginning, but at the end, since neural networks back then were kind of, well, they were not new, but they were kind of popping up. So most of them were trained on images. We just went full aboard with images, but I think the vectorized representation would be something interesting to try, and that could potentially bring a better result. Mm -hmm. In the data, if but there is also this trade-off, no? Because at the end, maybe the vectorized representation may be a bit more complex to understand that the the pixel one, the rasterized one. There is also this compromise on how the networks, how the models may learn the similarity measure, and if it would be actually uh, a good one. Or, or yeah, I guess like the the able. image is relatively. Simple. Well, it's relatively simple to you know to design you know neural network which by default operates on images, right? And yeah. Apply some convolutions, but if you have a vectorized uh, exactly. model, like okay, like what's the suitable representation as an even input to uh, you know if you want to do some neural network, right? Maybe it would be something like a mix, no? So you have the rasterized representation from where you can I don't know extract some edges, patches, and so on. And the vectorized representation, both as the input, probably could be combined a good option to have a better measure. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I think I wanted to. I have one question that I didn't ask regarding the the, the metric for appearance. Mm -hmm. So your metric is purely image based, right? The only thing that it takes mm -hmm. into the consideration as an input is an image. Would there be any benefit of adding, you know, for example, geometry information? For example, if I if I were able to render an object, right? Mm -hmm. And I've had a, you know, I have, well, all the information about my object, right? I could render a depth map. I could render the normal map, right? Would that, would, mm -hmm. would, would at the end, because, you know, at the end of the day, well, our brain is probably reconstructing some of this information, whether we, even when we look at the images, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have yeah, you yes. even considered this? Or, you know, your goal from the very beginning was just images. And no, I'm we wondering were... whether, you know, this could help. Like, this would, would this make your measure more accurate? Or, you know, or you think it's already so accurate that it's very hard to improve on that? No, we, we had this discussion about confounding factors, right? That we have uh, yeah. material, illumination, and geometry. Uh, we wanted our metric to be robust to changes on material, uh, sorry, on geometry and illumination. And we knew that images were the, well, the, the perfect format where you have implicitly or explicitly represented the three of them, uh, geometry, illumination, and material. So we just uh, thought, okay, we carefully designed the data in such a way that it has to learn the metric with a bunch of different geometries and a bunch of different illuminations. At the end, we're gonna create a model that is, uh, I mean, in, invariant to those unless the illumination changes greatly to, to this extent, let's say, no? It's a bit of what I tried to show in the last example, that we do not aim to classify, so our model takes into account what's the influence of those, mm -hmm. right? It's true that um, probably if you, I'm thinking uh, out of the box, if you have a geometry that occupies 90% of the image, and you have a very tiny one that occupies 10%, adding the geometry, would give extra information to the model to say, hey, here you have to look at 90% and here you have to look at 10% where you are comparing. And right now we don't have this information. Right, yes. So here it would give extra information and it would probably also help this ambiguity, right? Because at the end you have this geometry 
that it's very flat that could make your material looks diffuse when it's uh, specular. Mm -hmm. Also, giving this extra information could probably help the met the. No, I'm thinking. Well, if it looks for us diffuse, but the other looks specular, the metrics should actually say that they are different, even though the material is the same. My yeah. brain yeah. disconnected for a second. So it's complex. I think adding more information, the more information you add, the better results you will get in the end, mm -hmm. as long as you can model it. I mean, at the end, if the information that you are adding is so complex, no neural network will be able to model it. But if you add something that is fairly simple, like a normal map, I think it would help. Mm -hmm. Okay, then okay. Then I wanted to ask you something about this. Um, you know, studying all those factors mm -hmm. uh, for the appearance perception. I was, I was particularly interested in this motion. Like I that okay. kind of something got me <laughs> whatever in, reason interested. I was wondering what was your motivation behind studying. So, I I I I I understood that your intention was to to see how the appearance changes under motion blur, right? Yeah. So there's one, one thing I was wondering, like in real world, you know, we ideally, or even on the screen, we would not see the motion blur, right? If we have, let's say, display with high frame rate, we would mm -hmm. not see motion blur. So, you know, so, so this is one thing that I was wondering. And the other thing is, uh, I was wondering whether you, you f because, you you show the images in the experiment that you showed, they're static, right? So you apply this sort of motion blur, you blur the the image, and that's how you model the the motion. That's not necessarily what humans see <laughs> when the actually object is moving even on the screen. Uh, there's, for example, something which is called motion sharpening, which actually people show that if you have a you know blurred image and you start moving that image mm -hmm. actually our brain kind of do the uh de-blurring to that image that it appears like sharper yeah. so and i even was like at some point i was experimenting this myself that's why i'm asking you probably that you know that you take an image you blur it along the motion trajectory and then you show it like static and then you make it moving and when it when you make it moving mm -hmm. it actually appears as a sharper so yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering, yeah, on the one side, like, you know, what was your motivation? How were you, how you wanted to use this? And second, like, whether you consider all this kind of motion and, you know, the fact that you didn't actually put in motion those images that you were showing and so on, if you could comment so, on that. Yeah, so the motivation behind it was like, okay, we were, there is all these studies of different variables. We wanted to test out what happened with motion, uh, when, when an mm -hmm. object is in motion. Intuitively, you see that highlights uh, kind of dim, no? they are not as bright anymore. You see that the reflections are not as accurate. We wanted to see if this uh, certain behavior that we perceive kind of intuitively actually holds. It's true that we did not show the images in motion. We just, uh, we could potentially have shown a video. And we decided to go for still shots, mm -hmm. put sphere in movement and see what happens when uh, it has no movement or we increase it as much as we can. There, at the end, what we where we got is that we confirm our first initial impressions, right? Like, for example, the strength of reflections or how sharp the reflections look decreased when motion increased. And also about motion sharpening, if I know, I don't know if I know what you mean. It's like uh, maybe, for example, if you see a car in motion, the lights seem to be constant there or something like that. No, what I, what I mean is that there is like this, I think even maybe if you type, you know, after, of course, not now, like motion sharpening, <laughs> there is like a known phenomena, I think, that okay. like if you have uh, blurred images in motion, mm -hmm. then they appear as they were, as they are, uh, they appear sharper than the same images static. Mm. And this is, I think, the, the kind of the argument for this is that, you know, a human visual system when it sees the images in motion that tries to actually invert the potential blur oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that you know that uh, that that it perceives during the you know the motion so mm -hmm. uh, we i don't know i was not aware of this okay. well, I was, of yeah. the typical image of la in thanksgiving where you see only lights mm -hmm. 
blue, uh, sorry, yellow lights on one side and red lights on the other side of the highway that, that is fully packed. And it's because sometimes when you capture images in motion, the mm -hmm. emissive objects like light seems to kind of uh, have a trail, right? But this, yeah, yeah. this is. This didn't apply in our case because the objects were just fears that mm -hmm. they were not emissive. Okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. Th then I I wanted to ask you also. I'm just like going through my notes. Um, <laughs> um, oh yeah, about this editing the. Uh, the materials. I, that's just a detailed question. I noticed that that I think on the elephant you were showing when you were modifying yeah. the, you were making like a metallic elephant look more like a plastic. Yeah. And I think I could see there that also the color changes of the of the object. So it's not well. Yeah. It's a bit you know not very well defined, right? When you, when you have a metal. And you want to make it plastic what color of the plastic it should be right so i was like do you have an intuition what this will actually do with what this sort of techniques that you develop will do with uh, with with the color of the object yeah so uh this what happens sometimes is like well at the end what you want is manipulate the attribute you know and you want to make something more metallic or less mm -hmm. metallic and to do so what we try to learn is the high level attributes that we have collected from user ratings before Unfortunately, no data set is extremely perfectly well sampled. And sometimes what happens is that metallic objects tend to look gray by default, and you don't have a perfectly sampled metallic object from each color. Mm -hmm. We try to kind of overcome this problem by doing hue variations in data augmentation before feeding the images to the neural network. But there can be that there is some bias in the sense mm -hmm. that, uh, I don't know, the neural network has learned that uh, objects that are less metallic are less brown also. And there it may be slightly changing the color there. But it's some, most of the times it's a bias in the data that mm -hmm. we try to circumvent by adding this hue uh, data augmentation technique, but that, that is still somehow present. It slightly varies the color uh, sometimes of the objects. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then I would have maybe Last, last question about this relighting, and sure, just 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 a very general one. Uh, already, Anna asked a bit about the quality. You did this project with Adobe, so I'm just yeah. out of my curiosity. Is you know a part of this work going to be you know will will become a part of one of the Adobe projects? Well, if you cannot talk about it, then just, just say that. I think but I was just wondering whether you know the quality of whatever you come up with uh, would be already useful for you know putting this into the in the product and if not like you know what one would need to do to actually make a product out of it and you know mm -hmm. let for example adobe use it right i mean yeah it can be any yeah. other company or like mm -hmm. any other um, application that uses it but like what what is left there if there is something so yeah, there has been actually my Adobe supervisor contacted me last week that he wanted to try a few things in order to try to push it to a product. But I think there mm -hmm. are still things that remain to be done. What Anna mentioned, the quality of the images. Right now, the model is so huge that unless they have changed the GPUs that they had, it could only fit like 512 or something like mm -hmm. that images. Uh, there, as long as they have a bigger model or that uh, Deep learning, I don't know, improve somehow that you can use less layers and then therefore less memory. Then you can use the images much higher. Also, it has another problem, and is that um, at the end, the spherical harmonics representation is limited. We try to kind of circumvent these problems by adding this extra term in the image formulation equation. But if you want to have a metallic uh, thing with very sharp highlights, mm -hmm. it will be hard, quite hard. So although we have we attempt to model more complex materials due to the problems of spherical harmonics that basically they are very bad and high frequency details like uh, specular reflections, uh, some materials will still not be properly represented. But if you, for example, use it on a face, which is more or less diffuse, it could work. Or if you, if you I mean, at the end, when you do a full body photo, 
uh, there are few things that may look diffuse. Unless you have a super strong sun hitting on you here and you went for a walk and your skin is a bit oily or wet, mm -hmm. it may not look that that diffuse, uh, that specular. So there has been interest on in that sense. They asked me for the code several times and so mm -hmm. on, but I don't think it's ready. To. Okay. Okay, so I think, yeah, thank you very much for the answers. Thanks. And now there would be, I guess, I will look, yes, on my cheat sheet. I think now is the time when, uh, you know, maybe many, anyone from committee would like to ask another question. If there are some remaining questions or questions that... Uh, I'm good. Okay. I'm good too. Okay, so then we would open the questions to other uh, people who are attending this, this meeting. And we would open the questions to the people who hold already the PhD degree. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, I will take it as no. <laughs> uh, maybe we already exhausted all <laughs> questions uh, from the committee. Okay, so now there would be a time where uh, your supervisor, so uh, I assume uh, Diego and, and Belen can say a few words if they, if they wish. Right. So hi again, and, and thank you, Piotr, Romain, and Anana, all three of you for, for being on this committee. Thanks again for that. Um, from our side or, or from my side, uh, I just want to say, I mean, it's been a pleasure to work with, with Manu. Um, he, from the start, he was already, he was a very fast, a good implementer and a fast one as well. Um, he also had quite a, a solid background and particularly he, he knew about, he had done his master's in applied math and statistical modeling, which always helps. Um, in, in our discipline. So he had this solid background, uh, he was good, but it's also been great to see him, I think, grow as a researcher over the years. Um, he's improved his skills. Uh, and I mean, he has become more rigorous, more thoughtful, more reflective, I don't think. I see him smiling, so he knows what I mean. But I mean, but it's, it's been great to see him grow, actually. And, and I think, well, his contributions speak for for themselves, so no need to, to go on a lot about that. But yeah, I mean, also, well, one thing I wanted to say, he, he was passionate about deep learning from the start, and, and you can tell that he still is. And, and shows in his work as well. But he has also shown an amount of flexibility in the sense that he has had to work with um, applied perception and the psychophysics literature, which was quite foreign for him. Then also with quite graphics, like pure graphics rendering related stuff, which was also distant for him in the beginning. Um, so he has shown this ability to adapt to, to other domains. And I think that's, that's great as well. Um, on a personal level, I mean, he's, uh, yeah, he's a pleasure to work with, as I said, and I think he's been great for, for the group as well. Um, ever since he joined, uh, he started working with Elena and, and Diego and, and then with myself as well and others. I, I think, um, the group has benefited a lot from, from having him. He's always eager to share his knowledge to teach others, to explain to others, and to go for beers with others, which is also great. So <laughs> overall, I mean, both on a professional and on a personal level, uh, a pleasure. I'm, I'm happy to see him here today like this. Thanks, Valerie. <laughs> yeah, and when you speak last, and Belen speaks first, so basically I would repeat everything that she said. I totally agree. And Manu is one of those guys that you want in your group, period. Uh, he's an all-around researcher with versatility, the technical depth, and he's a very sweet guy. And he's always <laughs> willing to help others. Um, and we value that a lot. And we have just been lucky to supervise him these uh, four years. 
very proud that he could choose what to do next. And that's the main goal to offer people the chance to choose what the future is going to be. And, and even though he's leaving, yeah, we're happy to see that he's going where he wants to go. So everything that Belen said, I subscribe all the words that she said. Manu, congratulations. It's been a pleasure. And of course, we're just saying this because you have to buy us lunch in a few minutes. <laughs> so yeah, congratulations, Manu. A pleasure mm -hmm. to work with you. Thanks, Diego. Thanks. I'm Belen, thanks. <laughs> Okay, Th thank you, Bella and Diego, for those very nice and kind words. Uh, so now, uh, so this is uh, actually the end of this part of the of the of the defense. Now, will the committee will leave this this meeting and will go to talk and to discuss the the defense, and then we'll be back and we'll yes. come with the results. Thank you, Anna, for confirming that. <laughs> you, you, you have the link, right? Um, for the yes, other I have the link. So okay. see you there, then. we'll say bye bye, and then we'll be seeing us, I assume, soon. Yes. Good. Bye. Manu, enhorabuena. Eh, sorry. Gracias. Voy a aprovechar el impas para devolver una llamada a mi padre, que me llamó justo ahora y le colgó, ¿vale? Ten bien. Ya hablaremos durante la comida. Nos podía ver para la grabación, Ana, porque ahora todo lo que Hostia. digamos está siendo grabado. Es verdad. Ah, bueno. Sí, sí, sí. sí, 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 sí. sí YouTube.